Okay, hello, my name is Julian, and today I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about narrow complex tachycardias. Thank you very much to Dr. Bob Butler for reviewing the content of this talk and his feedback. So quick review of the conduction system of the heart before we begin. Try and pause this and see how many of these numbers you can name off. Okay, I'm assuming you've done that. No worries if you didn't. So sinoatrial node going down to the atrioventricular node, little bundle of his here, bifurcating into the right bundle branch, the left bundle branch. Left bundle branch has a posterior fascicle and an anterior fascicle. All of this terminates into Purkinje fibers which innervate the myocardium of the ventricles. So how does that match up to our ECG waveform? Well, we know that the P wave is basically depolarization of the atria. The PI interval, beginning of the P to the beginning of the Q, is the time it takes for an impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node and finally down to the ventricles. So a heart block will show a prolonged PR interval if it's like a first or a second degree heart block, for example. QIS is our depolarization of the ventricles. And then finally, ST is when the ventricles will repolarize, you know, when the potassium is coming back into those cardiac myocytes and going back to its baseline um, voltage. Okay, so what is a narrow complex? Uh, well, basically, anything regarding the QIS complex above 100 milliseconds is pretty much abnormal. Above 120 milliseconds is definitely abnormal. Those are three small squares. It could be a bundle branch block or a ventricular rhythm. And we're not really interested in that today. We're looking at narrow QRS. So certainly below 120 milliseconds. Just remember that number. That would be abnormal to be above that. So how do these narrow complex tachycardias come about? Well, we've got two main mechanisms. The first is abnormal impulse formation. So just impulses being randomly or, or just formed in inappropriate places around the heart because the heart, anywhere in the heart can generate cardiac uh, impulses, you know, ectopic foci. So the first one to look at, atrial tachycardia. That is when there is a little focal point somewhere in the atrium which is firing off impulses inappropriately and resulting in a tachycardia. Atrial fibrillation when the entire atria are just fibrillating like crazy and it's firing off chaotic, irregular impulses down into the ventricles. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. That's when you have three or more focal ectopic areas of the atria firing their own wee impulses down into the ventricles. Okay, so that's abnormal impulse formation. The second mechanism for regular non, uh, narrow complex tachycardias um, is re-entrant circuits. So the most common one of these is AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Um, this is when there is a, an abnormal impulse formation set up in the AV node. Uh, you'll remember there's a fast and a slow path where if something goes awry in there and a, uh, an impulse gets trapped, it goes round and around and around, and that can result in a tachycardia as the impulses travel down. You've got a macro re-entrant circuit, which is AVRT or AV reentrant or reciprocating tachycardia when you have an anatomical anomaly with an accessory pathway and an impulse can get trapped in there too. And then finally we've got atrial flutter, another reentrant rhythm where within the atria an impulse gets trapped and goes round and round and round and that can result in a tachycardia as well. So that was pretty fast but just a bit of an overview. So why is it important to know about these types of rhythms, the narrow complex tachycardias? Well, first of all, it can be pretty uncomfortable to experience these. You can have palpitations, shortness of breath, you can have some chest pain, you can have dizziness, all these different things. Um, and certainly you can have people pitching up to your department with adverse features, shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia and heart failure. And, you know, although these are broad terms and we don't always DC cardiover every person in AF with a background of heart failure, if somebody's in with a really poor, compromised cardiac output and they've got a heart rate going 160, you might want to think about cardioverting them. So just remember these features because that's important. So some questions we want to ask ourselves if we've got someone who's presenting with a narrow complex tachycardia. The first one, as with every patient, are they stable or are they unstable? And by stable, we're thinking about do they have none of these features? If they're unstable, i.e. they have some of these features, and they've got a dodgy looking ECG, then you want to talk to somebody ASAP about DC cardioverting them. Okay, so let's assume that the patient is like the majority of those presenting with a narrow complex tachycardia. These are the other three questions. First of all, is it fast? 
If yes, then we're looking at a tachycardia. Second of all, is it narrow, i.e. the QRS complex? If yes, we're looking at a narrow complex tachycardia. And third and finally, to help us discern what rhythm it is, is it regular or irregular? And we know it can be pretty hard to tell this because if a rhythm's really fast, we can't really see actually, is it regular, is it irregular? So these are three ways to help us. First of all, try measuring out the RR intervals. We've got the QRS, so the R wave up here. Grab your piece of paper, notch off on the piece of paper two or three R intervals and uh, move it along the ECG and check that they all match up. Secondly, look for your P waves. We've got here PQRS, PQRS down here, uh, not so much. So if you've got regular P and QRS interv intervals consistently, that's probably regular. Third, try your vagal maneuvers. Basically, what we want to do, if you imagine this is a little window here into the atrial activity, if you can stretch out this window, if you could take this QRS and place it over here, suddenly you've got a larger view into what's going on between the QRS complexes. It could be P waves, it could be flutter waves, there could be no P waves. The way to do that, increase the parasympathetic tone via vagal maneuvers. That will slow down conduction through the AV node and increase the RR interval. Adenosine is something we'll get onto in a bit. All right, so let's assume you've got a patient with a narrow complex tachycardia and you decide this is regular. So we've got three options that it could be really. First one, sinus tachycardia, SVT or paroxysmal SVT more accurately, and then finally atrial flutter. So sinus tachycardia, I think this is really uh, important to know about so that you can discern it from other uh, tachycardias, tachycardias that may need specific treatment. First thing to say about it, it tends to be of gradual, at least more gradual onset. It doesn't come on suddenly. There's usually some discernible cause like pain, infection, dehydration, anxiety, etc. And this tends to be also quite a bit of variability. Ask the patient if they're on telemetry or you're measuring the heart rate with pulse oximetry or whatever. Try and take a deep breath and see if that heart rate slows down a bit and has some variability to it. Reentrant rhythms and many of the paroxysmal SVTs do not have that kind of variability. In terms of the ECG, there's some interesting features to note. First one is there will be P waves. So if we look up in the leads that help us with this the most, V1 and lead 2, those are the leads that allow us to see P waves most clearly, you know, typically speaking. The interesting thing about V1 is that you get these biphasic P waves. So biphasic P waves are unique to sinus tachycardia. And if you see those, and they're followed by QRS complexes in quite a regular, consistent manner, hey-ho, you've got sinus tachycardia. Um, the other thing to note is that you can have a normal axis. So lead 1 and AVF are all positive deflections. So normal axis... Um, uh, P waves that are discernible, particularly if they're biphasic in V1 um, and it's regular, it's narrow complex, then you're probably looking at sinus tachycardia. If you're not really sure, and you know, we do get people sitting on the department and everything looks like it's ruled out and they've got heart rate of 140, we're otherwise happy to send them home, give them a bag of fluid, see if that slows it down. Often it does. The other thing is, if you want to treat it, treat the underlying cause, you know, treat their infection or their pain or their anxiety, whatever it may be. So other variants of sinus tachycardia that you may want to look at for your own interest, inappropriate sinus tachycardia syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. They're kind of exactly what they say on the tin, to be honest. All right, so second of all, SVT. Now, this is a bit of a misnomer, but we do know what we mean when we say the word SVT to each other. Just to be clear, all of the rhythms that we're talking about today are indeed SVTs i.e. they are supraventricular or they occur above the, the ventricles. Um, so actually a more uh, accurate way of describing this group of um, arrhythmias would be paroxysmal SVT. And this is an umbrella term for a specific group of rhythms. But before we get onto those groups, let's talk about some of the characteristics it tends to be much more symptomatic than sinus tachy. People can actually feel the palpitations and they really feel the um, the effects of having this sort of rhythm. It tends to come on quite abruptly, often very um, inappropriately as well, when they're not doing the type of thing that would warrant that sort of heart rate. Generally, 150 to 250 beats a minute, minimal variability versus sinus tach. A bag of fluid isn't really going to uh, reduce this. And then finally, P waves may come before, within, or after the QRS. And so 
let's have a look at the ECG first, shall we? So this is AVNRT, which is your most common type of paroxysmal SVT. And if we do our normal questions, is this fast? Well, it looks like about 150 beats a minute. Is it a narrow cuirass? Certainly is, sir. And is it regular or irregular? Well, it looks pretty regular to me. Next, let's check out the P waves to help us discern what's going on. So V1 is our faithful friend. And I can't really see a P wave here before the QRS. Can't really see one here before the QRS. But hold on a minute. What are these little guys? So it looks like there are some P waves coming after the QRS, which is interesting. And actually, it's worth explaining, I think. Um, if we move on to this little diagram here, this is an illustration of a junctional tachycardia down here. And this is a tachycardia which arises from around the AV node or otherwise known as the junction, the junction between the upper and lower part of the heart. So if you've got, if you imagine if you've got a ectopic focus of beats from slightly before the AV node, these impulses are going to go superior and inferior. It's probably going to hit the, the atria before it hits the ventricle. So you're going to have a P before the QRS. If you've got the impulse coming from within or around this area of the AV node, it's probably going to hit the atria and the ventricles around the same time. So the P might be buried within the QRS and not even visible. If you've got the ectopic focus from slightly below the AV node, it's probably going to hit the QRS, bef sorry, it's probably going to hit the ventricles before the atria. So you'll have your QRS before the P wave. So that's why you can get um, variable P waves. And these are actually known as pseudo R waves or pseudo S waves illustrated here. In lead one, you might have sort of an RSR. And actually, that's not really an R wave because you can see it's not as spiky. That's actually a P wave. Similarly here in lead two or three or AVF, you might have an R and then an S, but actually, is that an S? Nope, it's a pseudo S. So that's actually a P wave coming after the QRS, but it's kind of buried in, so it's difficult to see. And if you want to try and figure out, is this a pseudo R, we R wave or a pseudo S? Was it a real R or a real S? Uh, then compare that ECG with their previous ECG. And if there aren't any ECGs, assume it is pseudo if it's a smooth P wave appearance, because your P waves typically tend to be quite you know, smooth and rounded. They don't tend to be spiky like this. So you, you could assume uh, that it could be a pseudo wave. All right. And then just a real quick one about the other uh, types of paroxysmal SVT under this umbrella term that I've mentioned, paroxysmal SVT. Atrial tachycardia, we've covered a little ectopic focus, firing off impulses. AVRT, again, we've covered this, uh, the accessory pathway, anatomical anomaly, and the impulse gets trapped, goes round and around there, or round and around there. AVNRT, again, within the AV node itself, getting trapped. And then junctional tachycardia, I've already mentioned down here, around the junction, you've got ectopic um, abnormal impulse formation. Saying all this, do not worry. I've just covered this for kind of context's sake, but actually cardiologists can have a hard time discerning all this too, and the management... For this group, this is all. We, this is kind of the detail that we need to know in clinical practice most of the time. Is all the same. Try your vagal maneuvers. Try some valsalva with blowing into syringe. Try carotid sinus massage in young or people with no stroke risk. Um, if that doesn't work, try adenosine. Adenosine transiently blocks the AV node, terminating for the most uh, most of the time these paroxysmal SVTs. Um, it tends to last, you know, five to 10 seconds. So it's a very transient thing. Uh, and 90% of the time, these two steps will sort out your paroxysmal SVT. Now, just to, uh, the other options are beta blockers, car, uh, alcium channel blockers, and DC cardioversion. Just a real quick word on Wolf Parkinson White. Now, if we look here, if you imagine, well, first I'll say Wolf Parkinson White is when somebody has an accessory pathway down here or here, known as the bundle of Kent. If you imagine if they've got an atrial flutter or an atrial fibrillation going at 300 beats a minute up here, most of the time those impulses are going to go to the AV node here. But we've got a gatekeeper who's actually going to stop most of those impulses directly traveling through. And that gatekeeper is the refractory time of the AV node. However, if you use adenosine or a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, i.e. an AV nodal blocker, on this patient, you're going to block the AV node. And where do you think all these 300 beat per minute impulses are going to go? 
they're going to go down the bundle of Kent. And as you can see, there's no gatekeeper here. So all these impulses are going to go straight down to the ventricles. And if it's 300 beats a minute, you're going to get the attempt of the heart to pump out 300 beats a minute. Basically, ventricular fibrillation. That will be a really bad uh, situation to be in. So be very wary and careful and don't give Wolf Parkinson white patients adenosine beta blockers or calcium channel blockers if they've got... Um, a tachycardia and this is what it may look like you've got your delta wave and it's wide complex because it's wolf parkinson white with the delta wave and the accessory pathway and it's irregular this is probably something like atrial fibrillation in wolf parkinson white okay atrial flutter so this is our final narrow complex tachycardia that is regular so remember atrial flutter is a re-entrant rhythm you've got a uh, impulse going round and around in the atria up here and basically, if you imagine sinus um, P waves are generated from the sinoatrial node, if you've got P waves generated in this manner going round and around, they're going to be abnormal P waves, i.e. flutter waves. That's why they have this sawtooth spiky appearance. And if we look here, we can see that um, we, can, we can actually see these sorts of spiky P waves. So we've got actually a fairly nice rounded P wave here and here, but here's a spiky one. Here's a slightly spiky one. Here's a spiky one. And if you'll notice, we've got a P wave, a P wave, a P wave, and then probably a P wave buried in here. P wave, probably a P wave buried in here. And you can actually notice for every two P waves, there is one QRS. So this is a two to one conduction. And this is the most common type of atrial flutter. Normally, the atria in atrial flutter are conducting impulses at around 300 beats a minute. So we can see the AV node is doing a really good job of not allowing 300 beats per minute through. We've got about 150 beats a minute. So we're getting a two to one conduction. And something called the Bix rule um, is quite a useful heuristic for determining is this atrial flutter. The Bix rule is basically if you can see a spiky P wave, a spiky P wave, a spiky P wave, bang in between regular QRS complexes, then you're probably looking at atrial flutter with a two to one block or sorry a two to one conduction um so that's atrial flutter you can have variable ventricular response because if if the av node is flip-flopping between a two to one conduction or a three to one conduction or a one to one conduction you could have uh, irregular heart rates but it's only because the AV node is responding variably. But generally speaking, beware the what beware the 150 beat per minute regular tachycardia, because that's the most common type of atrial flutter. So how do we unmask these P waves? If you can imagine, if only we could just get rid of some of these QRS complexes and see what do the P waves actually look like? Are they definitely flutter waves? Well, let's prolong the RR interval by trying vagal maneuvers. Increase the parasympathetic tone. Try adenosine if you want to. It's actually safe in atrial flutter unless you have Wolf Parkinson White, remember. You can try adenosine. That will uh, transiently terminate the, or, or yeah, basically transiently terminate the AV conduction, stop the ventricular response and the QRS complexes, and you'll see just atrial activity and probably just a bunch of flutter waves. Lewis lead as well. Look it up if you want, but this helps to accentuate and emphasize atrial activity. And management is basically as per atrial fibrillation, which we're coming on to now. So we've covered our regular narrow complex tachycardias. Let's move on to our irregular narrow complex tachycardias. AF is a very familiar friend for all of us. No P waves because the atria are just firing off at such an irregular chaotic uh, rate. The rate is also very irregular because of that chaotic nature. And the ventricular response can be extremely variable. If someone's got high sympathetic tone, if they've got uh, thyrotoxicosis, it could be very fast ventricular rates. If they've got beta blockers on board or parasympathetic tone is increased, um, uh, then it could be a lower ventricular rate. And this is a fast AF. And you can see, you know, we don't really have any P waves. It's irregular. It's narrow complex. Hey ho, it is atrial fibrillation. So how do we manage this? Well, first of all, try and, you know, really just try and treat anything that's driving this. So if you've got an infection that's driving it, treat the infection. That will often terminate the AF if you treat it adequately. Um, so just try and get on top of anything that you think might be driving it. If it's thyroid related, uh, do that as well. Try your best to figure out what's going on there. Could be, um, could also be heart failure, you know, uh, backloading into the atria and causing that just try and get underneath it 
Okay, so there, this is nice guidance, as I've mentioned. If there's somebody bef uh, with atrial fibrillation less than 48 hours, this in the emergency department is going to be a very specific patient demographic generally. I've seen one person uh, talking about who they tend to clarify classify as being uh, a candidate for this and that's somebody with just atrial fibrillation no other driving factors and a chads 2 vasculature of one or less so very specific for ed cardioversion sometimes you may be thinking oh, let's anticoagulate them and get them home and then bring them back in for rhythm control under maybe cardiology but i've got to be honest this uh, particular arm of management is not really what we will be doing very often at all and if you're thinking about it discuss with a senior this is where we're going to be handling most of our patients, where we're uncertain how long it's been going on for us, more than 48 hours. We're going to try and control the rate. Beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment for this. So something like 2.5 bisoprolol stat uh, orally, or if you need a little bit faster, uh, get someone on telemetry and give them some metoprolol that could be 5 milligrams or 2.5 milligrams if they're a bit older and frail. Um, but basically, beta blockers are pretty safe. Diltiazem is another option if this is contraindicated, you know, if they're asthmatic or if there's some reason they can't have the beta blocker. But you can't use this in, uh, you know, heart failure that's that's got reduced cardiac function and output. Digoxin is a distant third option. Uh, reason being, it takes quite a while for the digoxin to take effect. So if you need something controlling in the emergency department, you might need to use a different drug that controls it faster. Uh, in people with high sympathetic drive, like their pyrexial infection is going on, because digoxin acts by increasing the vagal tone, the parasympathetic tone, if they've got a high sympathetic drive, it may not work so well. And the other thing is, if they've got CKD, a bunch of other comorbidities, they might be tricky as well because of digoxin levels and uh, toxicity. But, however, you can use digoxin. If you're worried about a patient having poor cardiac function, like uh, if it's shown in an echo or you think they've got very poor ejection fraction and they need some inotropic effect from the drugs, you can certainly give it. So something like 500 micrograms as a bolus and then after that 250 micrograms sort of regularly thereafter. But really beta blockers are good. Digoxin good for uh, patients who you're really worried about cardiac output, you need some inotropic effect. But here we've got the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines and we can see ejection fraction greater than 40% or less than 40%. Beta blockers are still a fine option for us. So that's irregularly irregular or just to be honest, irregular tachycardias, uh, which are narrow complex. Your vast majority are going to be atrial fibrillation. Next, uh, we can have tachycardia with variable AV conduction. Basically, as I've mentioned up here, the AV can conduct the atrial impulses at a variable rate, um, such as an atrial flutter. Multifocal atrial tachycardia, that's when you've got three or more areas in the atria, one, two, three, for example, firing off their own little impulses, and that will be irregularly irregular. And because there are more than there are three or more atrial foci, you're going to have at least three different types of P waves. As you can see here, this P wave is different to this P wave is different to this P wave. That is versus AF where there are no P waves. And then finally, sinus tachycardia with frequent uh, random premature atrial complexes firing off on top of that could also give you an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. Whew, okay, so we've covered quite a lot. Let's wrap this up. So our approach to the patient with a narrow complex tachycardia, do they have adverse features and a dodgy ECG. Discuss with a senior or grab somebody and consider DC cardioversion. Let's assume they're stable. The questions we're gonna ask are, is it fast? Is it a narrow QRS? And is it regular or irregular? If it's regular, if it's sinus tachycardia, treat the underlying cause, give them some IVT, give them some time. If it's a paroxysmal SVT, you know that umbrella term for all those other um, uh, rhythms, try your vagal maneuvers. That can work a lot of the time. Try your adenosine. Um, third, it, it could be atrial flutter. Basically, treat as per AF. And a quick word on adenosine, it will work for most regular uh, narrow complex tachycardias and it will unmask some of the others, such as atrial flutter. If it's irregular and there are no P waves, then you've got uh, atrial fibrillation, most likely. If there are P waves, it could be atrial flutter with variable conduction. Could be having a bit of two to one block here, a bit of four to one block there. 
Multifocal atrial tachycardia is another potential if there are those multiform P waves. And then finally, sinus tachycardia with just random frequent premature atrial complexes thrown in could also be another potential. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that was somewhat helpful and I wish you all the best.